Well, the kinds of tasks I would have to give them in that setting need to be very different than if I have them face to face in a room and they can work on a whiteboard or vice versa. If I have them in an online setting where they are working on a shared whiteboard or Jamboard or something like that. So the nature of the task has to, in many ways, fit the environment. Then again, I have to think very carefully about what kind of tasks I want to give for them to be able to work collaboratively as opposed to just You're listening to the godfather of the thinking classroom, Peter Lilladal. We spoke with Peter way back on episode 21 of the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast about how he built the components of the thinking classroom and we needed to bring him back on because we only got through a small fraction of what we were hoping to dive into. If you haven't listened yet to episode 21, we strongly encourage you to push pause on this one and head over to give it a listen. But once you're done listening there, you'll be uh, itching to get back to listen to this one. So uh, I guess uh, it's almost like a back to the future moment right now. So like to any of you who just did that and are back, welcome back. (laughs) Yes, that's right, John. Stick around because, as always, Peter drops some classroom move knowledge bombs. In particular, he shares why groups of three are better than groups of two in your math class, at least when you're face to face, how to choose a task to fit the environment instead of modifying your environment to fit the task, four practices to help move group synergy work to an individual knowing and understanding, and finally, why descriptions of effective teaching strategies shouldn't necessarily lead to prescriptions. Cue up that music and let's do it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteamminds.com. And I'm John Orr from mrorr-isageek.com. We are two math teachers who together, with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense making, and ignite your teacher moves. John, we are two count it two episodes away from our 100th episode of the show and what better way to spend it than with a guest who joined us way Mm -hmm. back on episode number 21 that's right that's right Uh, we are super proud to bring dr peter lilladal back on the show to continue our conversation about building thinking classrooms and uh, also discuss some ways we can implement those practices during the covid19 era yes uh, john i I'm ready to dive into this mm-hmm. episode. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. But before we do, uh, we want to announce the dates for our 2020 Make a Math Moments Virtual Summit. It is coming up on Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th, which is open now for registration. You're absolutely right, John. This is one of our favorite times of the year because we get the honor of bringing some amazing minds from the math education space straight to you, just like Peter. And actually, Peter is going to be joining Mm -hmm. us, you'll hear in just a moment. And we continue to find ways to manage to do it for free. That means free registrations for all you math moment makers from around the world. Mm -hmm, You got it. If you uh, want some amazing math professional learning, just like we did last year, from the comfort of your couch, we encourage you to pause this episode right now and head to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to register for the 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit. Yes, that's right. We are running our second annual free online math professional development summit for K through 12 math educators. The date again, Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th. Peter, our guest today, and the wonderful Judy Larson will be one of our over 20 sessions being 
presented. Mm -hmm. Coolest part yet, some of the sessions will be happening live over Zoom, while others are pre-recorded for you to enjoy at your convenience over the weekend. Go ahead, register for this year's summit at makemathmoments.com forward slash summit. Listening to this episode after this year's summit, you can still head to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to add your name to the wait list for the next Make Math Moments virtual summit. All right, John, let's dive into this great conversation. Uh, Conversation number two, or Mm -hmm. should I say the continuation of conversation number one with Peter. Hey there, Peter. Welcome back to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. It's been a while since the last time we spoke with you here on the podcast. We chatted with you way back in our early episodes, episode, I think, 21. This episode, I think, is going to be 98. So it's been a while. (laughs) So over a year, I think. You shared your background on teaching and how you built the idea of the thinking classroom. We want to chat some more about that with you here this time. But how are you doing these days? What's going on? First of all, thanks for having me back. What am I doing? Well, I've been like everybody else. March came with a big surprise and I had to shift my teaching online. It wasn't so bad for me because I only had three weeks left in my term teaching at the university. So shifting into online when you already had a really strong rapport with your group wasn't horrible. I spent a lot of time in those three weeks. So trying like many different things every week just to get a feel for what was possible and what the students, and when I say students, these were practicing teachers and pre-service teachers had sort of tolerance and patience for. And and then I taught a course in the summer. But again, I was very lucky because it was with a cohort of master's students in Grand Prairie who I already had a very strong sort of personal rapport with, established in face-to-face settings. So it was just extending that way. And since then, I haven't been teaching anything else, but I've spent a lot of time finishing off the book, Building Thinking Classrooms, that's coming out on October 20th. And then, of course, all the edits and the proofs back and forth and back and forth and so on and so forth. So I've been busy. Oh, busy, busy, busy. We've got lots to chat about in regards to both the book, but also kind of backing up a little bit with, you know, that surprise you referenced back in March. Some people have been joking and I try not to joke outside of the education community like this, but we just went back to school here in Ontario and I've been joking around at work saying that March break is finally over because it's been such a long haul here. But again, everyone was working very, very hard to try to keep students engaged, especially students that may have maybe not had access to technology or some issues on that front. So I'm wondering, can you dive a little deeper for us on what did it look like for you? So It sounds like you already had that rapport with your students. So transitioning online is probably much less cumbersome. What was that like for you, if you could paint us a picture? Okay. So what I did was, because when I teach university classes, they're Mm -hmm. already four or five hours long. So first of all, that wasn't going to work. The Zoom fatigue was just going to wear everybody out. The Zoom NATO, they say. Yeah. (laughs) So what I did to begin with, was I assigned some random groups. So I started playing with this sort of synchronous, asynchronous idea. And I thought I wanted to come up with sort of a hybrid of that. So what I did was I made random groups, but I had them work asynchronous from the rest of the class, but synchronously with each other. So I assigned some tasks for them to do in their groups, but they did them not during our synchronous class time. So they could decide when they wanted to meet and how they wanted to meet, whatever platform they wanted to use. And they were working collaboratively on these tasks. And then I created an asynchronous discussion board where they had to go in and enter some details of their work, not necessarily their answers, but thoughts on what were the hiccups, what were the challenges, how they get over those challenges, things like that. So it was this sort of synchronous, asynchronous space where they obviously were working synchronously in their groups, but asynchronously from the rest of the groups. And then when we were together as a group synchronously, we were able to have whole class discussions about those tasks and so on. Yeah. So it's almost like you kind of tried to make the best of both worlds there, whereas I think some teachers were like, let me just go online and do synchronous lessons. And we were with our kids for an hour here or an hour there. 
And then sounds like you're like, let's also make use of that time that you're not going to be online. So I think that's pretty great. Whereas I think also a lot of teachers were like, let me go on for office hours and let me just answer questions. And it sounds like you really made the most out of your opportunity kind of in that not so great situation. But you mentioned a couple of things I want to riff on a little bit here, especially you said random groups. And I know that we talked a lot about some of your tips for creating thinking classrooms in our last episode on episode 21. But I feel like we didn't dive into that idea of random grouping. And so before we get into that, I wanted to bring up a couple of the things that we did chat about. We did talk about choosing tasks and what that looks like. We did talk about kind of what a room organization would look like. You had some really great quotes, like the one that we wrote down for the episode was there was these 14 ways to build the thinking classroom. And you said that, but there's a 100 ways to wreck it. And that definitely resonates with us because I know there's lots of things you can do right in a classroom, but so many things you can do wrong. But I think we just kind of riff on a couple of these 14. But Peter, let's chat about random grouping, because I know that there's so many people ask us about random groups. Like, how do you make groups? Do you make groups of two, make groups of three? Last time you talked, like, four wasn't great, but three was better. But like, maybe like, why? Like, why is that the case? And then how do you go about making those groups? This is a great question, really relevant right now, actually. So one of the things that happened in my research with thinking classrooms was I always had answers before I had theory or explanations. So relatively quickly, it emerged that groups of three were optimal for sort of intermediate and up. The primary, the very younger students, groups of two was best because they were still playing in parallel and just learning how to negotiate that social space. But groups of three were optimal. Groups of four usually devolved into a group of three plus one outsider. And that was really clear. We could see that in the data over and over and over again, no idea why. Since then, I've spent some time thinking about a theory that's called complexity theory. Now, complexity theory says that in order for a group to be generative, it needs to have both redundancy and diversity. So redundancy are the things that we have in common that allow us to talk to each other. So a common vocabulary, maybe some common notation. If we don't have that, we can't even get off the ground. Diversity are the things that we carry with us that are different from the other members of the group. And if you don't have diversity and all you have is redundancy, you might as well be working by yourself. But having that diversity really allows a group to be generative. The problem is when there was too many students, there was a sort of social layer that laid over top that created some noise in the system. So the theory is that groups of three sort of brings the right amount of diversity and the right amount of redundancy in the groups can be generative. But one of the things that has been really interesting to see is what happened in the spring when all of a sudden everybody had to go to this sort of online teaching. One of the things we discovered pretty quickly was that groups of three didn't seem to be working. And there were several reasons for this. One of them, I believe, was that silence in these online settings was, so if if you have a group of three and one student is silent, then you don't have enough diversity in the group. So what we started to notice was that we needed to artificially increase the diversity when we went into this online mode by having groups of four or five. And not just that, but doing some things, and you mentioned there's a hundred ways to ruin a thinking classroom. When we were doing the face-to-face research, One of the things we found was really problematic was when we would do this, when students got to think about a task individually before they went into their group, often when that happened, the group would never really gel. And it was because that think alone time created too much diversity. Students were entering that group knowing the answer, and some members hadn't gotten off the ground yet. And now the diversity was too great. But In the online environment, we also started playing with this, well, spend some time thinking on your own, again, to increase the diversity, because it's almost like the online setting was a diversity depleting space. It's interesting because when John and I are running any of our online workshops and courses and in our academy, we find that when we group Sometimes people will ask to be grouped with almost like a little pod that they can sort of learn alongside and we'll randomly select these groups. 
And in our own experience, we found in the online space that getting kind of that five to seven range, it sounded like you were saying four or five seems like a good number. Like we found if the number was too small, it's almost like that silence as you mentioned, and as soon as you said it, it popped into my mind, like when it's silent too long, it's almost like the energy's gone, or maybe there was no energy to begin with. And I'm really interested in this redundancy and diversity piece as well. That's going to be fresh in my mind the next time through as we're about to enter into another course here with a new cohort of educators. And that's really interesting to me. And I find that in person and face to face, that group of three, as soon as you were saying that that number, as it gets larger, there's some sort of social layer that's affecting things. I could completely see that. It's almost like the safety in the group starts to decrease, right? And now you're feeling a little bit more like it's a little more risky to maybe speak out. Whereas in the online space, I find like I just did a webinar today with kindergarten educators and we had 50 people in the room and I'm telling you, it was like not energetic like it would be in a face-to-face -face environment. So that's really interesting and I'm really excited for us to kind of continue through some of these ideas in your list of 14, but then also to kind of have a bit of a compare and contrast to the COVID era. Right. And that's one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about this summer is what is transferable and what doesn't need to change and what needs to change when you start shifting into these either an online synchronous or asynchronous or a sort of restricted face-to-face -face where there are some sort of protocols in place or a hybrid and how does that work I'm going to go back to something you said, too, that really struck something with me about this idea of when you're online, when you gave think time, it kind of killed the group think. And when they came together and I felt like this is the opposite experience of what we've learned as teachers in face to face, like think, pair, share has always worked great. You know, it's like think first, now join up and start on your whiteboards. Like I've always felt that when I ask my students to think first, and then share to the big group, I've gotten way more engagement and quick to work than say, just jump into group work or even just think on your own. Like, so I find that you know, like that comparison to being online is just all of a sudden that's just out the window. And I agree with you, like what else is transferable and what's not? So I'm wondering, like, what would you see as being optimal for trying to navigate group work and I want to spin it a couple of ways, too, in this pandemic world, because some teachers are fully online, depending on their school board or a blend like Kyle's school boards in a blend model. But my school board's fully face to face, but we're trying to social distance in our rooms. So it's like, what? how do I do group work when we're social distancing? Can we do it? Is it OK? I know these are all big questions that not all of us have answers to because it's so new. But what do you see as like being optimal? Oh, you know, optimal is a word that I use for something that emerges out of the data. So right. this is purely speculation, right? <laughs> yeah, but sure. But I, so I want to come back to gambling at this point. Yeah, that's right. I want to come back to something that we had talked about in the previous episode, which was this notion of thinking tasks. So one of the things I've been seeing has been bypassed in many ways is thinking about how a task fits a collaborative environment. So in the spring on Twitter, I spent a lot of time watching how teachers were trying to shape the environment to match the activity they wanted to do, rather than to shape the activity to match the environment that they were forced to have. So for example, if I'm teaching in an online setting and the students are operating in, uh, I can put them in a collaborative group, let's say, but they don't have any way to collaborate through notation. So there is no shared workspace. All they can do is talk to each other. Well, the kinds of tasks I would have to give them in that setting need to be very different than if I have them face to face in a room and they can work on a whiteboard or vice versa if I have them in an online setting where they are working on a shared whiteboard or Jamboard or something like that. So the nature of the task has to, in many ways, fit the environment. So if all the students can do collaboratively is talk to each other, then I need to give a task that doesn't require a lot of notation but requires a lot of discussion. 
and if even a worse scenario, all they could do is collaborate through text, then again, I have to think very carefully about what kind of tasks I want to give for them to be able to work collaboratively as opposed to just sharing their individual answers that they've come up with. So the difference between thinking together and thinking alone and sharing their work. Interesting. And when you say that, that makes perfect sense. Now, I'm wondering if I'm a math educator and I'm listening to the podcast and I'm going, okay, that's great. Can that work for me? And I'm seeing ways that it can because I can ask questions that are about almost like in the consolidation phase of a particular type of uh, task or unit or concept. But what did that look like for you? Like, so for when you were working, let's say with your students, did you find that you were unable to give certain tasks that you would have liked to have given? And if so, like, what did you do instead, like in place of that? So what I did in those spaces was when I was doing this asynchronous synchronous, I left it to them to find a way to collaborate so that they could collaborate using notation. So some groups would literally just have a personal whiteboard and hold it up and they, one person would scribe and they would talk to each other and they would collaborate that way. So there was a visual along with the vocal. The questions I would ask in the space, the asynchronous text space, were more about the task rather than solving the task. And you could think about that as, so let's say we have students who can only collaborate verbally. I don't necessarily want to ask them to find the zeros of a quadratic or a cubic, but I might ask them about the zeros. Right. What did you notice about them or, or, you know, what was the shape? Right. And what if, what do you think would happen to the zeros if I changed this coefficient from positive to negative? Or what do you think would happen if I did this? So it becomes about questions as opposed to sort of solving questions if they're working only verbally. I'm also as well, Peter, like I'm picturing this collaborative group. If let's say the number is a group of four or five and we've actually randomly selected these groups and now with all the software, it really just goes to show how tech companies and how fast they move to see how Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google Meet and all these companies were able to, on a dime, add in all kinds of features like breakout rooms and teachers are sharing hacks in order to make breakout rooms when they weren't available in Google, for example. And I'm picturing as well, like there's actually kind of a hidden benefit, even if students are working through a task together and much like the role of the scribe in a group, I could be holding up that whiteboard or my webcam can be pointed towards my little whiteboard on the wall or whatever it might be. And the rest of the group could be describing to me in much the same way as they might in a face-to-face setting. Did you have any success with that over this time? Or did you find that there were hindrances there or, or nuances there that sort of emerged that may not be obvious to one looking from the outside? You know, the groups that did it reported that it worked very well, but I didn't do it enough to be able to say anything definitively about it. But I can imagine that, of course, it's going to be more taxing. If you're trying to speak to a scribe and the scribe is trying to record what it is you're saying is very difficult if I can't at some point step in and say, well, can I scribe for a bit and so on, which, of course, is solvable if everybody has a whiteboard in which they could ping back and forth on. Like it's, there's no school like old school, right? Like this idea of being able to just have a whiteboard that you hold up to a webcam. But that's not to say that these shared workspaces like Jamboard and Whiteboard and Zoom don't offer that as well. Yeah, like I found some success with Jamboard in in the sharing of collaboratively writing. It was just sometimes hard to navigate where you were going to write and where was I going to write and how are we going to manage all that? Peter, I wouldn't mind chatting a little bit more about some of the other aspects of the thinking classroom, but I know that some listeners are listening going like, well, what are they? Which ones did I miss? Which ones should I go back and look at from episode 21? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the ones that you've written down or shared with us, the 14 kind of, and then I'll just let everyone know which ones we talked about in episode 21, but I'm going to let you choose one to chat about, and then maybe we can also chat about how we've modified or maybe it transferred or maybe it didn't into 
today's kind of teaching world. But the first one you had was problems and tasks. And we talked about that in episode 21 and how to kind of choose those. We just talked a little bit about that here now too. The second one was how we give the problem. Third one was how we answer questions. Fourth one is room organization. We chatted a little bit about that in episode 21. The fifth was groups and how they're formed. And we chatted here just now about that. Sixth was student workspace. We chatted slightly about that in the first episode with you. Seven was autonomy. Eight was how we give notes. Nine was homework. What's that look like? 10 is hints and extensions. 11 is how we consolidate. 12 is formative assessment. 13, summative assessment. And 14 is reporting. Lots there for sure. Where would you like to go to chat about? So first of all, those 14 practices are broken into four toolkits. And those toolkits are sort of what I call a pseudo sequence of implementation. So if a teacher is picking this up for the first time, it comes with a sequence of implementation. And it's called a pseudo sequence because These are clustered, and sometimes it matters what order you do them in, and sometimes it doesn't matter what order you do them in. But I'd like to talk about something which is what I call the responsibility toolkit. And this was one of the things that emerged in the research where we started to see, when we were first doing having kids in random groups working on whiteboards, on these great tasks, and even on curricular tasks, we were seeing all this amazing synergy in the groups. And you've probably seen this too, like these groups are just working through these tasks and they're they're doing so amazing. And then a week later, you test them and it's like, where are you? Like none of what we saw a week earlier was transferring into this individual test. And I spent a lot of time thinking about and researching what was going on there. And at first, we thought that maybe we were misseeing what we thought we were seeing in these synergistic moments. And we spent a lot of time looking closer. And I'll give you an example. We're watching a group of three students working through a sequence of tasks on, I think it was factoring quadratics, but it could have been another algebra topic. And every member of that group was completely locked into the task and they were solving. There wasn't anybody riding coattails of the others and they were piling on each other. This sort of bursting, it's called in the psychology literature, where they're just jumping on each other and taking turns holding the marker. And every single student was able to do those tasks on that day. We were certain that what we saw was comprehension and understanding. But again, that individual test a week later didn't produce the results that we had seen the week before. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand what is missing. How is it that we're not moving from that group synergistic knowing and doing to an individual knowing and doing? And this was early on in the research and all the tools hadn't developed yet. But as those tools, those practices started to develop and emerge, what started to become clear was that there was four practices that actually help move that sort of group synergy and the ability to do and know in a group to an individual knowing and doing. And these four practices are consolidation from the bottom, meaningful notes or notes to my future dumber self, check your understanding questions, which is what we formerly called homework, and formative assessment of helping students understand where they are and where they're going. Okay, so I'll go through each of these in turn. So a group is working in this synergistic way. And I think you've seen that in your classrooms and everyone's engaged, but they're operating at an informal level. They have their own vocabulary and their own informal notation, and they're working through these things. What consolidation does, and in particular consolidation from the bottom, is it helps move that synergistic work to a more formal language and a more formal system of notation and so on and so forth. So the teacher who leads the consolidation is able to take that synergy and formalize it somewhat. So that's the first step. The second step is now the teacher says to the students, okay, now I want you to sit down and for the next 15 minutes, I want you to write some notes to your future forgetful self. So what do you have to write down now so that in three weeks, you'll be able to remember what you did today? And it turns out the note-taking one was really, really vital because this is the first opportunity the student actually has to move that collective knowing and doing to some sort of individual knowing and doing. We can think of it as a personal consolidation, right? The teacher has done that sort of 
consolidation for everyone. But now the student gets to sit down and actually think about what did I get from today? What can I write down to myself? And this became really, really important because our research showed that in a traditional note-taking sense of what I call I write, you write, so that I, the teacher, writes and the student, it's like the world's slowest photocopier, is what was missing there and what was happening when we were interviewing the students were that they weren't taking the notes for themselves. And in turn, they weren't using the notes. So these notes became really mindless. Whereas now, when we're doing notes to my future forgetful self, they're very mindful. They're thinking deeply about what do I write down? What examples do I include? How do I articulate this to myself? How do I annotate an example so that I could follow it, so that I can recreate this knowing and doing three weeks from now? The next one was check your understanding questions. Check your understanding questions. Again, we did a whole bunch of research on homework and we interviewed kids and we surveyed kids. And the number one thing that emerged was who are they doing the homework for? They're doing it for the teacher. Why are they doing it? For marks, which was completely out of sync with why the teachers were assigning homework. The teachers were assigning homework because they wanted the students to see what they were doing wrong and learn from their mistakes and sort of a self-assessment. They wanted the homework to be for checking their understanding. And so we shifted that. We shifted it from homework. We stopped calling it homework. We stopped calling it practice. And we shifted it to just check your understanding questions to more centrally situated in who it's for and what it's for. And we gave a whole bunch of autonomy and responsibility around that. We didn't mark it. We gave more questions than necessary. The students got to choose which ones they wanted to do, so on and so forth. But it focused them more on actually checking if that knowing and doing they could do in the group, could they now do it as an individual? I'm loving this because you're outlining so many important pieces here and this idea of consolidating a lesson. We talk about that a lot on the podcast and how important it is. And I love how you take that synergy and formalize it and make sure. And in a lot of ways too, you know, I'm picturing these students and you were painting a picture of students who were right into it and solving problems and doing all kinds of great work. And, and that's amazing. But at the end of the day, sometimes we forget as educators that just because they're getting answers and they're doing a great job, sometimes they sort of miss the point, right? Like the big idea that's sort of laying right in front of them. And some groups do pick up on that. And maybe some people in groups pick up on it, but others don't. And that is really important. And I love this idea that it's sounding like, and I'm hoping that you can confirm or deny this, but this consolidation after doing the work, it's again, and students are given this opportunity to investigate, to solve, truly solve problems instead of mimicking. I know we'll talk more about your book as well. The term mimicking is something I've been using a lot ever since having the opportunity to review that book. And this idea of them creating a meaningful note at the end, whereas in that slowest photocopier ever example you gave, typically in a traditional classroom, you would actually do the opposite. Like the teacher would fire off some examples. There would be this big, long note. Students are copying it because they have to, not because they want to. And then in the end, we're asking them to solve some problems. So again, it's like this sort of flipped classroom idea. John and I always say the real flipped classroom is putting the problem solving first and consolidating after. What does that look like? I'm wondering if you can sort of compare and contrast that if we were to look at maybe two types of classes, like let's say like a higher level course, like a pre-calculus or calculus, what might that look like, sound like, or does it look any different in say a class I think you had referenced from your career in the first episode, I had re-listened to it today on the way home from work and you referenced, I think it was called the essentials class class, what might it look like in there? Is it any different? Is it the same? And I guess at what point does the teacher step in to help? And I'm picturing a, more of a facilitator role than, say, the guy, the sage on the stage. It would be more of like a, a there to help guide the conversation and help students sort of like formalize their thinking. But I'm wondering if you can dive a little deeper on that, because I know there's going to be people at home listening saying like, wow, this sounds awesome. But how am I going to take that and do that with my group, especially if that's maybe outside their comfort zone? 
Right. So first of all, I think a really good consolidation is probably the most skillful thing a teacher can do in the room. So in a thinking classroom, you got to picture this. The students are all working on the whiteboards in their groups, and they're moving through curriculum tasks, right? So they're moving through tasks, whatever they are. And what you're seeing on the boards there over time is a lot of really good work that would be nice to draw attention to as part of the consolidation. So there's three types of consolidation in the thinking classroom. I can go over them in a minute. But ideally, what you want to do is draw on as much of the student work to honor the thinking that's been happening in the room so that the thinking doesn't feel like I'm going to let you guys think for 20, 30, 40 minutes, and then we're just going to ignore what you've done and now do it my way. So we wanted a consolidation to be an extension of that work that they were doing. So a whole bunch of things have to happen in order for that to work effectively. Number one, you have to make sure the students don't erase the things that you want to draw attention to for the consolidation, which means that while they're working, you have to walk around with a red marker and kind of lock things in, draw a box around it and tell the group, don't erase this part. And so there's that. You have to lock things in. Number two, you have to see the space. So let's say they're working on a task and nobody's making a graph. And it would be so great if there was a graph for the consolidation. You might go up to a group and say, hey, I really like what you're doing. You have a really nice table of values and you're trying to make a hypothesis here. Could I make a a suggestion that you make a graph? (laughs) (laughs) And then when they've made the graph, you go and draw a box around it and say, don't erase that. (laughs) So. You orchestrate it. Sorry to cut you off there. I'll I'll, I'll let you finish. But it's like, you know, you've got to have that foresight. We've often referenced the five practices for orchestrating productive mathematical discussions by Mary Kay Stein and Peg Smith and that whole anticipation. You got to like map out what you need it to look like so that you can do exactly your trick move there of bringing out what you need so that you can make a really great connection stage. Right. So this is why I say it. You have to be so skillful because as you're trying to manage the thinking classroom, you're also trying to lock things in. You're trying to seed the space and anticipate what you need. And the third thing you got to do before you consolidate is now you have to sequence what it is you want to do. And again, this is in the five practices, but you have to think about, okay, so how am I going to take the students on this journey in this consolidation? And in a typical, for like a 100 years, consolidation has been what Alan Schoenfeld refers to as leveling to the top. So I was hoping everybody would be able to solve this problem. Only three groups solved that problem. So my consolidation is I'm going to go over how to solve that problem. And it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of what's called zone of proximal development. You're trying to consolidate at a level well above what many other groups got to. So what we did in Thinking Classrooms was we started experimenting with something called consolidating from the bottom, which is, okay, let's start at the very bottom. Let's start with some of the very fundamental work that the groups did that every group got to. And now let's work our way up and work our way up and work our way up. And what we do then is we're moving actually through everybody's zone of proximal development. We're able to elevate everybody's thinking above where they got to as a group, but at the same time as honoring the work that they did as a group. I totally agree that that skillful consolidation or connect stage is so important. And we get a lot of questions about that too. Like, how do you do that? When do you do that? What's the right time to do that? And people who've asked us who are listening right now, we just say it depends. It depends on so many things. It depends on what you've mm-hmm. seen, what you've anticipated. It also will depend What's on the, the time that you have. You're after. Yeah, yeah, it does depend on the time that you have in the room, even though we'd love to have an unlimited time. It depends yeah. on so many factors, which we always say takes practice, right? Oh, like, yeah. You can't be good at it right away. You're going to have to try it and see how it goes. And you have a plan in mind, but you definitely have to orchestrate it. And it's like managing an orchestra, just like your stages that you've outlined there. At the beginning, we thought, okay, we're going to create these what we call thresholds. So as soon as every group has gotten across this threshold, we're going to consolidate. And then the first time we tried it, every group shot that through that threshold in eight minutes. And we're like, okay, so now we can, we're moving the threshold, right? Other times you think, okay, here's how far we want them to get to, but we realize on the ground that that's not going to be achievable. So you have to be nimble. And one of the things we found, the biggest depends really is the energy of the room. There comes a point where 
the energy is waning. You just can't get them to achieve more. And now it's sort of time for consolidation. Right. We've often said, you know, like I know that you've referenced this meaningful note and sometimes that formalization for you to step in and go, this is where we were going. This is how it connects to what you guys all have done. And you kind of tie all those people's work in and then you kind of steer them in where the learning goal was for that day. I think a lot of people think that this is purely student driven at that point where it can totally be teacher driven to be, this is where we were going. This is what we want to pull from this and making it clear. Like Kyle talked about that too. It's like, we got to make it clear to students because a lot of them might've just missed the boat on what the main goal was there that day. And I think right. that's we just really important problem part. solving, right? That's their big takeaway. Yeah. Part yeah. of the consolidation. And that is, you know, there was this movement in education. It started about 20 years ago in the UK where we had to name the intention at the beginning of the lesson. And what we found is it makes much more sense to name the intention as part of the consolidation. And you just said that. This is where we were trying to get to, and this is what it's called. Whereas naming it at the beginning, like telling a group of students that today we're going to learn how to factor quadratics where the leading coefficient is greater than one, doesn't mean a lot to them. But if they have a whole bunch of experiences, and then we say, that's what that's called. Right. Or you give them a problem. And, you know, I'm picturing the rat, uh, the, I'm trying to think of the oh, rat. Yeah, the cat. cats and the rats problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that problem, right? You tell kids up front that today, we're going to use scaling in tandem and proportional relationships right. in order to solve problems. Well, first of all, the curiosity, some of that is out the window. But then second of all, the problem solving is out the window because you're sort of been funneled right to a place. So we've talked about that so much and how, again, and I love how you've mentioned it a few times, just how skillful teachers have to be in, not just in the consolidation, although that I would argue, yes, that's sort of like the big event in the lesson to tie it all together. But as you're crafting your lesson from a high level and anticipating and organizing it and planning it, and then finally delivering it, that all has to be in mind. And I think that's why that shift to naming it at the beginning they talked about students knowing where the target was and so forth. But I feel like that was based on a very procedural approach to mathematics. So we're definitely all in line with that as well. And it emerged, and you see a lot of this happen in education, is it's this transfer, this tension between what I call uh, description and prescription. So somebody looked at some classrooms and noticed that when students that in some high-functioning classrooms, students understood what the intention was. That was a description. And then they said, oh, well, that must be a good prescription then. So let's now make it a mandate that you have to name this intention. And it doesn't work that way. It's the same thing with roles and group work. We experimented with this too. And it emerged as a description. Somebody noticed that high-functioning groups, there was a leader, there was a recorder, there was a timekeeper, there was an encourager, and so on and so forth. Those are descriptions of highly effective groups. That doesn't mean that the prescription is going to work. And we see this happen a lot in education where we turn descriptions of really effective things into prescriptions for how to do things. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's big the, takeaway right there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's lots of teachers listening who, because we've got that question a lot about, we got to write the learning goal of the day on the board. How do I get around that if I have to reveal it later? And our recommendation has always been that write those learning goals as big idea goals. Like in your example about factoring, like maybe the big idea, right? Like what's the big idea? Like why do we factor? It's in one reason, there's lots of reasons, but I mean like one reason might be like we're going to understand the power of equivalent representations or equivalent expressions. And, and that's it. Like you don't have to say anything else. That's a big general statement, but you're at least saying that's the main kind of goal we're looking at. I'm not going to tell you how, I'm not going to tell you where, and we're going to discover that later. I know you did have four practices that help move group synergy into individual knowing. We talked about three of them. The last one was that formative assessment. Right. So formative assessment, it's interesting. When you look across Canada and other curricula and so on and so forth, you know, formative assessment came into vogue about 20, 17, 20 years ago. And 
it was sort of described as summative assessment is a gathering of information for the purpose of reporting out. Formative assessment is a gathering of information for the purposes of informing teaching. And I know when formative assessment came out in BC, that's exactly how it was defined. Now, who are we missing in that equation? The learner, right? And so one of the metaphors that I drew on around this has to do with navigation. In order to be able to navigate, you need to know two pieces of information. You need to know where you are and where you're going. Because if you don't know where you are, you're already lost. And if you don't know where you're going, you won't know when you get there. So if we want students to navigate their learning, then they need to understand those two pieces of information as well. They need to know where they are and where they're going. So where they are is what they can do. And where they're going is what they're required to do that they don't yet know how to do. So how do we provide feedback, formative assessment that actually informs those two pieces, where you are and where you're going? And there's some very technical aspects to that. But that turned out to be probably the most powerful practice in terms of increasing student performance. When we implemented that, we saw a 20% increase in student performance in 60% of the kids. But that turned out to be that final practice that helped move from group knowing and doing to individual knowing and doing. And together, these four, I call them the responsibility toolkit, because aside from consolidation, if you look at all of the other three, the responsibility is on the learner. Meaning, notes to my future forgetful self, check your understanding questions that I'm doing for myself to check my understanding. They're not being marked. They're not being collected. I have full autonomy over it. And then that sort of formative self-assessment that allows me to gauge where I am and where I'm going. Those three things place a lot of responsibility on the learner. And one of the things that was interesting that happened in March was that I was in communication with several teachers who had been working on those aspects of thinking classrooms prior to the pandemic lockdown. And they reported that once they went into that online, synchronous, asynchronous, whatever their model was, their students were able to cope much better because they had that sort of responsibility to be able to navigate their own learning. And through these three practices of meaningful notes, check your understanding questions and knowing where you are and where you're going. You know, and as I'm looking at this, and it hasn't come up explicitly in this episode, but back in episode 21, anyone who's listening who hasn't listened to 21 yet, and you're this far in this episode, well, <laughs> you kind of did it backwards. You, you should have started there, but it's too late now if you're already with us this far. But back in episode 21, you gave an example about trig and the unit circle. And we came to this conclusion that you had said that you were for many years teaching very conceptually, right? And that's something as well that I think can be easily missed, like listing the consolidation piece, the meaningful note, checking understanding, informative assessment. I'm sure those would be very helpful as well, even if I'm teaching from a procedural standpoint or what some call a procedures first approach. But to have true understanding, you really have to conceptually understand what's going on. And that is what I think keeps those wheels turning, especially on the meaningful note to your forgetful self and that checking understanding questions. And then obviously leading into this formative assessment, which also the way you've described it is really not just teacher formative assessment, it's student formative assessment and self-reflection. It's really hard for some students to be able to actually do any of these things if they're just mimicking. And I know in your book, you talk a lot about traditional classrooms and how many classrooms out there are still sort of operating in that way. I know John and I, we can relate so well to that because we were that teacher for so long. And we know what that's like. And that's sort of how we remember learning. And it might not have been our teacher's intent, but at the end of the day, we were memorizing and we were mimicking. And it made it really hard for us to even attempt doing any of these things, not to mention that this was never on our radar to make our own note or to do our own checking understanding questions. But even had we tried in that particular or from that particular approach, it would have been really, really challenging because we were constantly checking an answer key at the back of the book, right? And if you ever have an all teachers listening, they've all had the student come up and say, is this right? And that's sort of like, to me, a clear sign 
Now my response is always to students is, I don't know, is it? And if they don't know whether it's right or wrong, then what are we doing this for? And so at this point, I want to shift to the book because I think based on these two episodes, episode 21 and now this episode, number 98, which I'm still shocked that uh, we're at episode 98. I had the chance to review your book after I've seen you live a number of times. We've had chances to catch up at dinners before and talk in person. And then also getting to read this book. And there were still so many nuances here. And you'd think after two episodes that we'd be able to dig through all 14 of your tips for building a thinking classroom, but obviously we've come up much short. I want to give you an opportunity to share, frame this book out for us. Does it go through, and I'm asking these questions like I've never read it before, does it go through all 14 of these tips? And you know, what are people going to learn when they grab the book over, let's say, listening to these episodes or even seeing you live doing a keynote somewhere or a full day workshop? Okay, well, so the book is called Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, grades K to 12, 14 Practices for Enhancing Learning, published by Corwin. It comes out October 20th. I wanted the book to capture all of what the thinking classroom was, all 14 practices, the pseudo sequence that emerged from the research as to the best order to implement it in, and then all of the little micro moves, I call them, all the little things that we as teachers can do to make each of the practices even better. And so the book has all of that in it. The way every chapter is laid out is that aside from the introduction, there's 14 chapters, one chapter for each of the 14 practices. The chapter sort of starts with, so here's what the issue is. If it's about homework, here's what the issue is. And here's now the problem. So I spent a lot of time in my research looking at the sort of status quo. What is the most normal or the, the normative practice? And is that effective? And if not, what is the problem with it? So there's a section of, of every chapter that talks about the problems with the normative practice of doing a particular move, like homework or consolidation and so on and so forth. And then it has a section on, okay, so that was the normative practice and the problems with it. Here's what we learned from Thinking Classroom and the optimal practice that emerged from the research and how to do it. And then embedded inside of that are a whole bunch of really practical examples, anecdotes, photographs of teachers enacting it, descriptions, and these little micro moves and so on and so forth. So every chapter, and then there's a summary at the end of the chapter, which highlights the macro move and the micro move and gives some questions to think about and gives you some tasks that you can use to implement this. Awesome. I'm really pumped to get my hands on it. And we'll put the info in the show notes page for when it goes live to purchase on October 20th. Kyle, I think this episode, now we're recording this in advance, but I'm pretty sure this is going to go before that. Right, Kyle? Yeah, I think this episode is actually slated to go live on October 12th. So it will be, yeah, if you're listening to this, the day it goes live, you are just days away from being able to put this book in your hands. I'm guessing there may be some pre-orders online. I'm not clear on that right now. I don't know, Peter, if you have any information on that to share, but uh, feel free to share away. If you go to Corwin's website, corwin.com, you can search for Building Thinking Classrooms or you can search for Peter Lully at all, and it's spelt exactly the way it sounds. <laughs> um, then it'll pop up a page and you can pre-order now. Awesome. We'll get that link uh, and we'll throw that in the show notes for sure so you and people can go directly there. So check out the show notes page for that if you're listening. Peter, is there anywhere else uh, you'd want to direct people to go to to learn more about what you're doing and what you've got coming up? So I'm starting to build an accompanying website for this book. I'll put that out on Twitter when it's ready. It's not quite ready yet. And I'm going to start on that website. I think I'm going to start blogging a little bit about building thinking classrooms in the COVID-19 era. So what is it? Some of the things we talked about today. So this is what we learned from building thinking classrooms, 15 years of research in face-to-face -face settings. 
what does it now look like in a synchronous online or asynchronous or modified face-to-face or hybrid setting and start to explore that space conceptually, small amounts of experimentations and hope to get teachers who are implementing, trying those things to pile on and give feedback on some of those things. That is awesome, Peter. We are super thrilled to not only have you back on the show again. You know what? We didn't make it through all 14. So you know what that means, Peter? Uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe sometime in the next uh, nine months or so, we'll be knocking on your door out west again, and uh, we'll get you back on here. So we want to thank you so much for taking the time today to uh, share your insights about the building the thinking classroom with all of the math moment makers who are listening to the podcast from around the world. And uh, we're wishing you all the best with your upcoming book launch. I'm sure it's going to be a huge hit and very helpful to so many educators around the world. And thanks, guys. Thanks for the work you do. And thanks for all the teachers out there who are engaging in these podcasts. The mere fact that you're dialed into this means that you are change makers. So true. So true. Thanks, Peter. And uh, we'll be in touch. Wow. Thanks so much, Peter, for joining us on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. You, as always, have dropped a bunch of math PD knowledge bombs on us. I'm sure we'll have to have him back for yet another episode to continue digging even deeper into his thinking classroom Mm -hmm. framework. And I'm sure many of you out there are going to be rushing out to go grab that book. It was an honor to be able to review that book as it was in the draft stages. So I encourage you to definitely pick it up. Before we head out uh, of this episode, there's a quick reminder that the 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit is coming soon on Saturday, November 7th and 8th. So get yourself registered at makemathmoments.com forward slash summit. That's right, John. Our free virtual summit is going to feature live and pre-recorded sessions for you to enjoy. And you'll be able to catch the replays for up to a week afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if the weekend gets busy, catch what you can and then grab some throughout the following week. Yeah, Peter from today's episode will be presenting with a bunch of other amazing speakers. To uh, catch who they are, head to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit now uh, to ensure you get access to this awesome PD from your couch event. Awesome stuff, John. So how about you at home? What was your big takeaway from this particular episode with Peter? Go ahead, share it with a friend a colleague, or send us a message on social media at Make Math Moments on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And don't forget about our private Facebook group, Math Moment Makers K-12. through In order to ensure you don't miss out on new episodes as they come out every Monday morning, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. All right, friends, show notes and links to resources plus Full transcripts from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 98. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 98. Well, Math Moment Makers, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And high five for you.